said it to me once very clearly. He said, if anybody wants you, they can get you. There's nothing you can do about it. When the first shot was fired, the last thing in the world that even occurred to me is that the president could have been shot. Because, you know, this is America, and that sort of thing doesn't happen here. I can hear the shots. Boom! I knew the shot was fatal. It was one of those heart-rending things that you just could not understand. My God, how could this be happening? I didn't shoot anybody, sir. I haven't been told what I'm here for. There are a lot of people saying they should kill Oswald. A lot of people. Lee Oswald has been shot. We began to wonder what was really happening in America. Was there a vast conspiracy afoot? Fidel Castro was behind the assassination of John Kennedy. Kennedy tried to get Castro, but Castro got Kennedy first. Lee Harvey Oswald had the help of at least one other person. That person probably fired from the grassy knoll. I think the evidence shows that the CIA killed President Kennedy. The enormity of the crime, its unexpectedness, and the fact that nobody got a chance to see Oswald on a stand, I think the doubts will remain a hundred years from today. CBS reports. Tonight, who killed JFK? The final chapter with Dan Rather. Good evening. For nearly 30 years, the world has been haunted by the greatest murder mystery of the 20th century. Who killed President John Fitzgerald Kennedy? Were the death of a president and the pain endured by the nation caused by one lone assassin? Generations of Americans have carried these questions in their hearts. Those old enough to remember where they were when they heard the news and those young enough to know November 22, 1963, simply as a day that changed the course of history. On that day, I was in Dallas reporting for CBS News. In the three decades since, CBS News has never stopped its own independent investigation, never stopped searching for answers to the most important questions of the Kennedy assassination. Tonight, in reliving and reviewing those four dark days in Dallas, we bring you the results of our most recent efforts, some insights you may want to consider, and memories. Memories that, for many of us, cannot, will not die. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, who solemnly swear and I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of your ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. So help you God. So help me God. It was an era in which no was an impossibility. There was no such word as no. Anything was possible. And the youth around the world felt that. He was magic. Um, I remember when he was on the campaign trail, and it was very late at night, and he was like two hours late for this campaign visit, but we all just stayed there. We just couldn't wait to see him, to touch him, to look at him. And as he came down the street, there was a street light in the background, and he almost was like a halo behind him. And it was just so incredible that you couldn't help but follow him. You just couldn't. And that's how I remember him. I met him in the halls of the Senate. We both came from Boston. He was a graceful man in, in, in phrase and in physical movements. He was, uh, despite that bad back, he was a very natural athlete. A great golf swing. He epitomized grace for me. And Mrs. Kennedy? Well, she brought this extraordinary new spirit and style to the White House that I'd never seen in my time. And those children that were just, uh, you know, so damn decorative, weren't they? 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm speaking to you from the White House. Wait a minute, John, wait a sec. Don't say anything, because i got to give this speech. Can you sit down over there now and be a good boy? Goodbye, John. Young John Kennedy seemed to be leading us into a new era of youthful exuberance, if you please, over the fun of life, the fun a country could have, being itself, being important in the world. We were dancing on clouds. And where was the Kennedy administration in 1963? Where was the Kennedy presidency? Actually, it wasn't in very good shape. The country thought it was in better shape than it was. In the summer of 1963, John Kennedy faced one of his greatest tests, the bitter struggle for civil rights in the American South. He came into office with a great deal of promise and didn't realize the promise. He wasn't doing what we thought he should do, what the law required him to do. He didn't want to do anything to upset these southern barons who ruled the Congress. Uh, he seemed to us to be moving on tiptoes when we thought what was required was a bold march toward the future. But many southern whites felt that Kennedy was marching too boldly. His popularity there fell. So on Thursday, November 21st, he left for a tour of Texas, the key southern state in the next elections. I received a letter from a lady in Dallas saying, tell the president not to come to Dallas. Somebody's going to be out to kill him. I was stunned by this letter. And I went to see the president. I said, look, this is a warning. I mean, you've really got to be careful when you go to Dallas. And he said, you know, if somebody wants to kill a president, he knows he's going to get killed himself. That'll happen. That's the way I look at it. He said, Mrs. Lincoln, I can't live a life where I'm afraid to go out in the public. I, I can, you know, if they want to get me, they can get me in church. I'm still going to Dallas. This Texas trip is the first out-and-out -out political appearance for Mrs. Kennedy at her husband's side since the 1960 campaign, and Democrats are making the most of it. Today, at the airports and in the streets of San Antonio and Houston, crowds continually yelled, Jackie, Jackie, and seemed more interested in a look at her than anyone else. This is Dan Rather in San Antonio, Texas. Two years ago, I introduced myself in Paris by saying that I was the man who had accompanied uh, Mrs. Kennedy to Paris. I'm getting that somewhat that same sensation uh, as I travel around uh, Texas. Nobody wonders what Lyndon and I wear. A great crowd in Fort Worth. Great, great crowd. Then we fly to Dallas and we land in Love Field and the president and Jackie went right over to the fence. Crowds were tremendous. The reception there was warm, friendly, exuberant. And I had always had a little bit of uneasiness about the trip because I thought that uh, we might see some ugly signs or, or gestures along the way that would be unpleasant. We encountered none of that, really. School groups were out, there were nuns in the crowd, and it was just like a, a Boston welcome. Here comes the first car, and here is the President of the United States. Everybody was so wonderful to that young couple, and because I wanted it all to be so good, I couldn't resist, and feeling it was, I couldn't resist saying, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. Soon, the motorcade would turn into a murder. When we come back, the twisted trail of the alleged assassin. CBS reports, Who Killed JFK? The Final Chapter. Sponsored by Pontiac and your local Pontiac dealer. We are driving excitement. Welcome back, everybody. Fred, final question. Are you ready? I'm ready, Norm. Name the most affordable mid-size sedan with driver and passenger airbags, anti-lock brakes, and a V6. Okay, I know it's not an import. How about the Ford Taurus? Oh, Fred, I'm sorry. What? The most affordable mid-size sedan with all that stuff is the new Pontiac Grand Prix Sports Sedan. What? Did he show Fred what he could have won? Grand Prix's the most affordable. Who'd have guessed that? I was going to say Pontiac. I was going to say Pontiac. It was, uh, it was right after the kids were born. My skin got red, irritated. Oh, 
kind of dry. That's when you started using Vaseline intensive care? Yes. I don't know how it works, but it works great. Think about it like this. Watch. Nothing's happening. The lotion doesn't dissolve right away. Its moisturizers are absorbed into your dry skin to help it form a better barrier. Against what? Water damage. No wonder I love it. From intensive research comes intensive care dry skin formula. Yes, doctor. Oh. I'm getting a cold. And for my symptoms, I need a name I've counted on for years. From the makers of Advil. Advil Cold and Sinus. It's tough on colds, like Advil is on pain. Advanced formula Advil Cold and Sinus. Perspiration's okay when you're playing tennis, but not when you're close. If a guy smells, it's such a turn-off. Get a little closer with Arid. New improved formula helps keep you extra, extra dry. Yeah, I trust Arid. The Colonel's legendary lost recipe for rotisserie chicken is so good, it deserves its own special side dishes. Like tangy barbecue baked beans with bacon, garden rice with vegetables, macaroni and cheddar cheese, and hot cornbread muffins. Enjoy a great meal with a quarter of the Colonel's rotisserie gold, two of your favorite side dishes, and a cornbread muffin. And I guarantee these recipes will never get lost. Now, where did I put them? <laughs> the Colonel's rotisserie gold. At KFC, we do chicken right. The Clinton Plan for Health Care Reform. What does this all mean to you? The CBS Evening News. Team to cover your world. The Bears are coming off a win. The Chiefs are coming off a lot of wins. Sunday on CBS, it's Chicago, Kansas City. Kansas City, here I come. We're big fans. A ton of cocaine was smuggled into the United States of America. In cooperation with the CIA? That's exactly what appears to have happened. Sunday. Lee Harvey Oswald was barely 24 when President Kennedy was killed, yet Oswald's short life had twists and turns, adventures and secrets that provoked thoughts of intrigue and conspiracy. Oswald was born in New Orleans. His youth was troubled. He moved from state to state, school to school, failure to failure, with his struggling mother, Marguerite. He was a happy-go-lucky youngster, actually. He had a dog, he had a bicycle, and he was deprived of his father. Then he was born two months after his father had expired. But we must understand that Lee had two brothers, so he was not raised just with a woman alone. He studied animals, was often in the zoo, and as we know, he was picked up in the Bronx Zoo while in New York uh, uh, playing hooky from school. And I consider that normal also, playing hooky from school. Many, many boys do this. Lee Harvey Oswald's youth was far from normal. His mother kept losing jobs, and they moved five times before Lee was four years old. He was put in an orphanage for a while. By the age of 12, when they had moved to New York, he was in trouble academically and emotionally. You may be aware that at least one New York newspaper has quoted a social worker psychiatrist in New York as saying that at one time it was recommended to you that Lee be given some treatment. Do you recall that at all? Uh, that quotation that you just said is incorrect. She is incorrect. The doctor diagnosed Lee Harvey Oswald as emotionally disturbed. After a judge ordered that he be put in a home for troubled boys, the Oswalds left New York. In high school in New Orleans, Lee began to study communism at the public library. That didn't stop him from joining the U.S. Marines a few days after his 17th birthday. He was standoffish. He felt like he was a little smarter, possibly better than the rest of the people. He felt like that he ought to be the one doing the telling, uh, and he was just kind of mad at everybody all the time. Private First Class Oswald taught himself Russian in his spare time. The Marines taught him how to shoot. He hit 48 of 50 targets at 200 yards. He was happy to get out of the Corps three months ahead of time, supposedly to help his ailing mother. He spent three days with her, then left to pursue a long-held secret desire. In 1959, at age 19, Lee Harvey Oswald arrived in Moscow, here he began what he called his historic diary. A reading of excerpts today is revealing. October 31st. Two Russian policemen stand at the embassy. I go in. A secretary busy typing looks up. I say laying my passport on her desk. I'm here to dissolve my American citizenship. 
he came into my office, stood stiffly before me, that he said, I'm a Marxist. And I said, you're going to be a lonely man here <laughs> in the Soviet Union. I knew I was dealing with an immature young American, whatever he sounded like, however arrogant he may have seemed and what have you, you know, he was still, in my mind, he was a dumb kid. <laughs> he was very nice looking, and he had a slight southern accent. I rather liked him. He said he did not want to live in the United States because he would be living under capitalism and he would be exploited as he had seen his mother exploited. And therefore, he wanted to stay forever in the Soviet Union. The KGB in Moscow routinely investigated foreigners to see if they were spies or could be of help to the Soviet Union. Oswald asked to stay. It became the conclusion, we don't want to deal with this person. We don't want to talk with him. We cannot trust this person. It was final. Yuri Nasinko was the KGB officer in charge of watching Americans. For this rare interview, he asked that his identity be hidden. We asked why Oswald wasn't recruited. He didn't present any interest. He's former Marine, private or corporal or whatever, nothing more. Of course, if this Marine was working in uh, American embassy in Moscow or some other country, he would present the interest. But here, nothing. Evening. Receive word from police official. I must leave country tonight. My fondest dreams are shattered. I decide to end it. Soak wrist in cold water to numb the pain, then slash my left wrist, then plunge wrist into a bathtub of hot water. Somewhere a violin plays. As I watch my life whirl away, I think to myself, how easy to die. Oswald is laying on the floor, bleeding cut wrist, and he was taken in hospital where he said, I still will kill myself if they will not allow him to stay. The Soviets say they were trying to improve relations with the United States. A dead ex-Marine in Moscow would have meant trouble. So they say Oswald was permitted to stay, but far away from the capital, raising questions whether he was lucky or a tool of the Soviets. Official says they are sending me to the city of Minsk. I ask, is that in Siberia? He only laughs. I receive a small flat with splendid view of the river, almost rent-free. It is a Russian dream. I am to earn 70 rubles a month at the factory. I have a lot of money and hope. This is the shop where Oswald worked. His workbench was right here. We didn't notice anything bad about him here. He didn't like to work, but that was another matter. March 17th. Went to a trade union dance. Boring, but at the last hour I am introduced to a girl with a French hairdo and red dress. I dance with her, then ask to show her home. I do, along with five other admirers. Her name is Marina. Marina looked beautiful that evening, and she had lots of people interested in her. Then she came home around one in the morning and said, I'm not alone. There's an American with me. It was the Harvey Oswald. She is madly in love with me from the very start. Boat rides on Lake Minsk, walks through the parks. I decide I must have her. I propose, she accepts. We are married at her aunt's. At midnight, we are home. Everyone was very much against it. It all went so fast. I don't know why she was in such a hurry. But she loved him, and he also seemed to love her. The KGB, meanwhile, bugged his apartment, read his mail, and asked his best friend to be an informer. The agent said, you know Oswald, and you understand he's from the U.S., so you have to come to see us from time to time for the sake of your homeland. Golovachev says he met with KGB agents four times, told them nothing because there was nothing to tell. I remember he bought a Russian radio and it had a small defect in it. I repaired in a second with a simple knife. If Oswald were a spy, he could have done it himself. So I think he was not a CIA agent. And all that surveillance was for nothing. I am starting to reconsider my desire about staying. The work is drab. The money I get has nowhere to be spent. No nightclubs or bowling alleys. I have had enough. 
I now live in a state of expectation about going back to the United States of America. Oswald, two corpus of granat. In December of 1961, Oswald made two bombs. Devices. He also made devices to explode them. We didn't know why he was doing it. It was like his hobby. Former KGB spy Oleg Nechukorenko recently wrote Passport to Assassination, disclosing state secrets never before revealed. He and his wife were waiting for exit visas, and I think he made the bombs to frighten the Soviet authorities, to speed up his departure to the U.S. Marina didn't want to leave. They had a baby girl, but he managed to convince her to go. He showed up one day quite unannounced. He said, I have a new appreciation for freedom and for my country. And uh, he said, I've learned a hard lesson the hard way. And that was about the, the sum total of what one might call the moral statements, you know. <laughs> On the boat coming over to the United States, his attitude toward her, his treatment of her changed, and he started to slap her over the face. And it was the first time he was physically violent with her, but that continued and it became worse while they lived in the United States. The FBI began to keep track of the Oswalds when they returned. In Dallas, they were kicked out of their apartment for fighting. Lee began living alone when Marina moved in with a friend to whom she was giving Russian lessons. All I knew really about him was that he wanted her to be sent back to uh, the Soviet Union and she didn't want to go. I thought of him as an unhappy person, a person dissatisfied with the society he was in. I think he felt he wasn't noticed or given sufficient credit for being the sort of person he was. In March of 1963, Oswald paid $29.95 for a mail-order revolver and $21.45 for a Mannlicher Carcano rifle and a telescopic sight. Obviously, he liked guns. I went one afternoon to pick him up, went upstairs, and I think uh, the first thing he did, practically, was uh, uh, pick up this uh, photograph of himself, 8 by 10 holding his rifle there and some papers. I was a little startled. I suppose he was looking for a big revolution, and he'd join the revolution with his gun. He thought the only way change would come about was through violence. A few weeks after receiving his rifle, Oswald apparently tried to change things for retired Army General Edwin Walker, a right-wing crusader, by firing through Walker's window. The bullet went through the general's hair. He came in the house, 11.30. He was so pale, nervous, and did not talk. I said, what happened to him? And he said, he told, I tried to shoot General Walker. She knew that he had shot at Walker. She knew, and she didn't tell anybody. And later on, she told Ruth or someone that she was afraid of being deported back to Russia if she had revealed it. Unsuspected of the crime and unemployed, Oswald quickly left for New Orleans. He found a job oiling coffee roasting machinery and gained local fame handing out pro-Castro literature. You're a Marxist? Well, I have uh, studied Marxist philosophy, yes sir, and also other philosophers. But are you a Marxist? I think you did admit on an earlier radio interview that you uh, that you consider yourself a Marxist. Oh, I would very definitely say that I uh, I uh, am a Marxist. That is correct. But I, that does not mean, however, that I'm a, a uh, communist. Oswald's celebrity was short-lived. Not one person joined his Fair Play for Cuba committee. He was fired from his job for not working hard enough. Disillusioned and desperate, Oswald decided that he wanted to leave the country once again to live in either Russia or Cuba. He took a bus to Mexico City and visited the Soviet embassy. He came to our embassy explaining that the FBI in the U.S. was persecuting him, interfering with him getting a good job. To prove what he said, he pulled out a revolver. He said he was forced to carry it around all the time to protect his life. I've seen the telegram which came from Mexico City, signed by the KGB, where it was written, American Lee Harvey Oswald visited Soviet Embassy Consulate Department where he put a question asking to give him a visa. Please give us advice. I said, isn't it the guy who cut his wrist? Yes, I said, how come he is in Mexico? Advice was given in this way. We didn't want him. Who needed him? 
We didn't have any interest and the man who was defected then returned back. Now he wants again back to return. It shows the, the person, his mentality. Rejected, Oswald returned to Dallas seven weeks before the president would be killed. Lee had spent a week unsuccessfully looking for a job in Dallas. And this was a Monday. And my neighbor and I and Marina were all talking about uh, this difficulty, how hard it was for him since he, for one thing, was not able to drive couldn't get to a good many jobs that might be available. Uh, and a third neighbor who was there suggested that there might be an opening at the school book depository. Oswald got the job filling book orders for $1.25 an hour. One month later, on November 19th, it was announced that John Kennedy would visit Dallas. I would have supposed that when he saw the, the newspaper with the, the track going right past the window of the building where he worked, it occurred to him that he could, uh, he could shoot the president. And there he had already shot Walker and got away with it, Scott Free shot at Walker. And he came out on Thursday night to get his rifle, hitched a ride with the fellow down the street. He brought a package with him that day and he put it on the back seat. And I said, Lee, what's that? He said, remember yesterday I told you I was gonna bring some curtain rods. I said, curtain rods, oh, okay. I never thought anything else about it. I pulled up. He gets out of the car, takes the package, sticks it on his arm, and walks off. That particular morning, uh, three or four of us were standing by the window, and uh, Oswald came over, and he said, uh, what's everybody looking at, and what's everybody excited about? And so uh, we told him we were waiting on the president. And he asked me which way would the president be coming, and I told him. And so he said, oh, yeah. And I said, yeah. And then he turned around and walked off. The paths of John F. Kennedy and Lee Harvey Oswald were about to cross. The shots and shock would reverberate for three decades. He packs heavy. She packs light. She wears silk. He wears wool. He's comfortable at 68 degrees. She prefers 72. Good thing they own a Buick Park Avenue with available dual zone climate control. 72 for her, 68 for him. Too bad everything isn't as accommodating as Park Avenue. From Buick, the new symbol for quality in America. Lysol spray use number 64. That funky smell in the garbage can. Use number 75, Rover's latest surprise. There's nothing this can can't do. Clean, crisp, new Mountain Air Lysol disinfectant spray. As refreshing as all outdoors. You used to have to drag a shampoo home to clean high traffic areas and do the whole carpet with all the hassle, the wetness, the waiting. Introducing Resolve High Traffic Carpet Cleaning Granules. Just shake on, brush in. Sponge-like granules absorb the dirt. Later, vacuum clean. New Resolve High Traffic Carpet Cleaner. Introducing new improved Lysol Toilet Bowl Cleaner with a formula so powerful it's like having a brush in a bottle. Oh, that's better! Is the coast clear? Yeah! Look out! This kind of power makes cleaning your toilet easier than ever before. Improved Lysol Toilet Bowl Cleaner. It's like having a brush in a bottle. This is your captain speaking. We've just reached our cruising altitude of 31,000 feet. And in a moment, the flight attendants will begin serving lunch, and... Captain, we forgot the Colombian coffee. One hundred percent Colombian coffee, hand-picked by Juan Valdez. It's the richest coffee in the world. CBS reports, Who Killed JFK? The final chapter will continue. Tonight at 11, as more unbelievable allegations against Michael Jackson mount, actress Liz Taylor races to his defense. What did she say? We'll tell you. Then, day two of the airline strike. American scrambles to recruit new workers. But what about convenience for passengers? Find out tonight on Action News at 11. Tonight on Late Show with David Letterman, Dana Carvey, Meat Loaf, and Joan Cusack. You know, we've been recommended by the Clinton health care plan. Tonight... 
This is CBS. Every day, hundreds of thousands of people all across California turn to their favorite station. Unical 76. For 15 years, the Saab 900 has captured the hearts of demanding drivers and safety advocates alike. But now it's time for a new Saab, with an optional new 24-valve V6 and even better crash protection, announcing the rebirth of the Saab 900. Parents band together to protect their children from a child molester at 11. The motorcade went right through the heart of Dallas, then turned right and went a short distance, and then turned more than 90 degrees left. And the Texas School Book Depository is at that corner. We have just about made the turn, and I'm I had the job of keeping the president on time. And I, I looked at my watch, and it was exactly 12.30 Texas time. The president's car is now turning on to Elm Street, and it will be only a matter of minutes before he arrives at the trademark. And then I heard the first shot. It appears as though something has happened in the motorcade route. Something, I repeat, has happened in the motorcade route. I heard what I thought was a rifle shot. I thought the shot came from behind me. And I didn't see anything, so I was in the process of turning to look over my left shoulder into the back seat. I'm looking right at the president, and he had his right hand out waving to the people, and now he had pulled it in. And it's up around his neck, and he had fallen toward Jackie, and I said, I think our president's been shot. I had not gotten turned to my left to see the president when I felt uh, a sharp blow like somebody walked up behind me and hit me with a closed fist. The force of the blow was strong enough to bend me over, and I saw immediately that I was covered with blood. And I said, my God, they're going to kill us all. You see Mrs. Kennedy's pink suit. We understand Governor and Mrs. Connolly are in the car with President and Mrs. Kennedy. We can't see who has been hit, if anybody's been hit, but apparently something is wrong here. Something is terribly wrong. It was such a strange moment because there were people still smiling and waving little American flags and applauding because the motorcade blocked out the action that was going on. On the other side, people were screaming and hurling each other down because of the shots that were being fired. There's numerous people running up the hill alongside Elm Street. Police officers are rushing. Nellie then pulled me over in her lap and put her head down on mine and said, be still, everything's going to be all right. I was still conscious. Then I heard another shot. I knew it had hit because it sounded with an impact that loud. And after that shot, the car, our clothes were covered in blood and even chunks of brain tissue. And now, I'm looking at Jackie as she had climbed out in the rear of the car just about the time it had started to accelerate. And Clint Hill, the Secret Service man who was on the left front running board in my car, managed to get onto the car and push Jackie down and get on top of her at a time that we're going between 70 and 90 miles an hour. And it was a, a, a great act of bravery on, on uh, the part of Glen Hill. The Secret Service man is still spread eagle over whoever is in the car, the President and Mrs. Kennedy. And I turned in a different direction. I'd have made it. It's my fault. If I had reacted just a little bit quicker, and I could have, I guess. I'll live with that to my grave. 
Parkland Hospital, the Hesda shooting. Parkland Hospital has been advised to stand by for a severe gunshot wound. We in the press pool car sped off. I said to the driver, where could we be going? And he said, well, he said, the only thing I can think of is that we're going to Parkland Hospital. But I'll be very frank with you, Dan, the last thing in the world that even occurred to me is that the president could have been shot. Because, you know, this is America, and that sort of thing doesn't happen here. Many police cars converging on Parkland from every angle, from every point. President's wife, Jackie Kennedy, was not hurt. She walked into the hospital at her husband's stretcher side. I was at the studio. At the moment that the bulletin came, I turned around and shouted, let's get on the air, let's get on the air. Then we interrupted the soap opera that was on the air as the world turns. What you doing, Nancy? Cleaning up in here already? Well, yes. Here is a bulletin from CBS News. President Kennedy shot today just as his motorcade left downtown Dallas. He was wounded in an automobile driving from Dallas Airport into downtown Dallas, along with Governor Connolly of Texas. They've been taken to Parkland Hospital there, where their condition is as yet unknown. Hysteria hung like Spanish moss. Uh, it was a, a, an unbelievably sad scene because none of us knew at that time the state of Governor Connolly nor President Kennedy. JFK is on the stretcher. The right side of his head is blown off. He has a wound of his neck and the doctors are working and leaning over him uh, trying to get an airway uh, and, and all of us then embarked on trying to, to, to save his life. It was a lonely, terrible place to be and somebody brought two chairs, one for Ms. Kennedy they put outside trauma room one and one for me outside the room John was in and I sat there and she sat there, and we, we didn't converse. There sat Jackie on a chair, just like a statute. I went over and put my arms around her, but she didn't move. The motorcade went where it had originally been intended to go, to the uh, Dallas Trademark, where all this crowd was gathered at the lunch waiting for President Kennedy. And as we came in, it was the only time in my life that I've ever seen a rumor you, you could see across that vast room, uh, hundreds of people, many tables, you could see the rumor moving. People would turn and listen and say, throw up their hands, you know. Women here in shock, some have fainted. Secret Service men standing by the emergency room, tears streaming down their face. By that time, I'd gotten on the telephone of the Secret Service follow-up car to advise Salinger, who was on his way with Secretary Rusk uh, to the Far East. It was just a shock. And, uh, we, nobody knew what to do. We were on this plane and uh, we did have a discussion and uh, Dean Russ said, uh, I think we should get a hold of the State Department and have them contact all our embassies and see if there's any possibility that this is an international plot to kill John Kennedy. It was not implausible in 1963 to think that if there were going to be a nuclear attack on the United States, you might take out the president first. Uh, it may sound silly now. Uh, it is silly, but uh, it was not implausible that day. Nothing was implausible that day. I was having lunch with Bobby and Ethel Kennedy at their home in Virginia, and I was a house painter, and, and he walked over with a, a radio and started to say something that I couldn't quite understand. At the same time, the, the phone rang, and, and uh, Bobby ran to the phone, clapped his hand uh, over his mouth, came back, said that was J. Edgar Hoover. The president's been shot in Dallas. I talked with Bobby within a few minutes after that. And what did he say? What he said was that he'd heard about it from Hoover and he thought Hoover had taken great pleasure in telling him. As you know, they didn't get on at all. While John Kennedy lay in Parkland Hospital, Dallas police surrounded the Texas School Book Depository. Only one man had left the building, Lee Harvey Oswald. As sirens wailed and police radios blared his description, Oswald hurried to his rooming house, picked up a revolver, and set off on foot. Moments later, Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett pulled up beside him. The police car was driving very slow, and finally he stopped, and the man stopped. He folded his hands like this. 
He put him in through the window, up on the window, and he leaned over like this. The policeman got out of the car, and uh, as he walked past the windshield of the car, where the, they'd kind of lined up over the hood of the car, well, uh, the, this other man shot him. As police found J.D. Tippett, father of three, dead on the sidewalk, Lee Harvey Oswald took refuge in a movie theater. I was on my normal routine patrol duties until I got a report that uh, a suspect was seen going into the Texas theater. So I walked up towards the back of the theater where he was seated. And when I got to his row, I certainly turned in and I was about a foot away from him. I said, get on your feet. And when Oswald gets up, he just throws a right cross and uh, knocks McDonald back. And at that time, reaches under his shirt and pulls out a revolver. And while he was doing that, I was reacting and coming back and I was reaching for his waist. And as I reached for his waist, the pistol landed in my hand. And there was a struggle with the gun and the gun was just a matter of a foot or so from McDonald's head and Oswald actually pulled the trigger. The hammer and the firing pin hit me here in the fleshy part of my hand between the thumb and the forefinger, which saved my life. We handcuffed him and took him out of the theater and he was all the time protesting police brutality. That don't hit me anymore. Well, I was the only one that ever struck him in the first place. But I was elated that we had got the guy so quickly because it was only 90 minutes after the shots had been fired that he was arrested in the Texas theater. The pistol seized from Oswald was the weapon he purchased by mail seven months earlier and, according to the KGB agent in Mexico City, was the same model as Oswald pulled out of his pocket in the Soviet embassy. Regarding the probable assassin, the sheriff's officers have taken a young man into custody at the scene, a man 25 years old. We, are re we just have a report from our correspondent, Dan, rather in Dallas, that he has confirmed that President Kennedy is dead. There is still no official confirmation of this, however. It's a report from our correspondent, Dan Rather, in Dallas, Texas. The doctors there worked for 10 or 15 minutes or so before they concluded it was no use and pronounced him dead. I wandered through uh, Parkland Hospital and found an office, and I called my New York office. Dallas, November 22nd. President, President John F. Kennedy was shot and killed here today, period. With no one to, no, I'm sorry. With no one attending him but physicians and nurses, he died without regaining consciousness or uttering a word. Johnson was running up and down the corridors saying, oh, it's been a conspiracy, it's been a conspiracy. And he said, let me go out to Air Force One, I want to go right away. And uh, he did. And he laid in the bottom of the, of the, of the car on the way out. John F. Kennedy died at approximately 1 o'clock Central Standard Time today here in Dallas. He died of gunshot wound in the brain. It was a very difficult announcement to make. I have no other details regarding the assassination of the president. And I recall thinking that by saying it will make it so. And if I didn't say it, it wouldn't, all this horror would not be so. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Vice President Lyndon Johnson <clears throat> has left the hospital in uh, Dallas, but we do not know uh, to where he has proceeded. Uh, presumably, he will be taking the oath of office shortly and become uh, the 36th President of the United States. I do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute before that president beckoned Mrs. Kennedy to come into that picture. Then she had on this pink outfit, which was visibly and heavily splattered with the blood of the president. She refused to take it off. And when the coffin was brought aboard and they draped the flag over it, she sat no more than three feet from it, never left it. 
it was the longest ride of my life from, from uh, Love Field, Dallas, to Washington. But I was hoping it would never end because I knew that once we got to Washington, it was going to be different. We went out to Andrews Air Force Base to meet Air Force One, and there was a lot of commotion, almost chaos there. Uh, Secret Service wanted to handle the body. Uh, we thought it was our duty to do it, and so there was some pushing and shoving and as to who was in charge. Uh, finally, we got the body off the plane and into a Navy ambulance. Mrs. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy. They are to ride in the ambulance, normally to Bethesda Hospital, where the body will remain for the night. She was dazed. She was dazed. We were all dazed. It was a terrible blur. People in, people out, uh, people trying to get her to take a rest, and she wouldn't. And Bobby Kennedy was there looking lost, just lost. President John F. Kennedy comes back to the White House for the last time. I finally went to bed, I think it was around 5 in the morning. At 7 in the morning, the phone rings next to my bed, and the operator says, the president's calling you. I suddenly said, oh my God, I've just had a terrible nightmare. And then I hear this voice saying, Pierre, this is Lyndon. We've got to talk. And that was, for me, the final blow that John Kennedy was dead. When we return, Oswald meets his fate. Ever wonder why a hamburger costs 10 bucks in Tokyo? Or why a cab to the airport there runs about 120? Or why their luxury cars seem so expensive, especially when compared to the Oldsmobile 88 Special Edition? which, even with air, automatic, cruise, tilt, anti-lock brakes, and dual airbags, cost just $19,995? It's your money. AT&T says MCI only saves you pennies. Well, if that's true, why doesn't AT&T give them to you? It's Domino's $25 million Super Mario All-Star Instant Win Game. With every order, get a free chance to win thousands of special power set prizes. Now buy our new crunchy thin crust pizza and get free twisty bread. Something for nothing when you call Domino's. Hi, it's me. Okay, here's the plan. Dinner at Scott's. Uh, you know, Andy's friend. D don't worry, you'll like him. Can you be ready by 7? I love you. Bye. Hi, it's me again. Uh, you got more time. Scott's is off. We're going to Andy's instead. Be there at 8. See ya. Bye. Hi, it's me. I forgot. I said we bring the wine. Can you do that? You're the greatest. Bye. Hi. You're gonna kill me. All across America, people are discovering a better place to buy tires. All the top name brands at one store, only at Sears. And when it comes to price, we won't be undersold. Now through November 28th, we've got all Bridgestone road handlers on sale, as low as $29.99 each. That's right, Bridgestone's as low as $29.99, backed by free Sears road hazard coverage. Sears Tire and Auto Center. We're driven to satisfy. Tonight, Dana Carvey. I did not know that. Ah! Meat Loaf and Joan Cusack. Folks, if you don't have a show of your own, watch mine. In a gothic tale of brotherly greed. My father is dead. Will a trip to Ireland give Jessica a lead? I have to know what happened. All new Murder, She Wrote. Then the Waltons are coming home. Ralph Waite, Michael Lernan, and Richard Thomas are reunited with the original cast for a Walton Thanksgiving. Sunday. When President Kennedy's body was in Washington, Lee Harvey Oswald was in a Dallas cell, unaware that he soon had a violent rendezvous with Jack Ruby, a man much like himself, two lives full of failure and desperate for recognition. Both finally found fame and infamy in the same jail. 
I positively know nothing about this situation here. I On Friday night at midnight, Lee Harvey Oswald was led down into the basement to a police lineup room. He was put on display, especially for all the out of town and foreign reporters who were flying into Dallas from everywhere. Did you kill the president? No, I've not been charged with that. In fact, nobody has said that to me yet. Uh, the first thing I heard about it was when the newspaper reporters in the hall uh, asked me that question. You have been. Nobody said what? Sir? You have been. Nobody said what? Okay, man. Okay. I was in Tokyo at that time, and on the road, I turned on Armed Forces Radio, and the announcer said that a man named Lee Harvey Oswald had been arrested in connection with the assassination. I said, that son of a bitch. Oswald, did you shoot the president? I didn't shoot anybody, sir. I haven't been told what I'm here for. You have a lawyer? At the police station, when I saw him later on at night, he was proud of what he'd done. He thought that he'd be recognized now as somebody who did something. Marguerite, his mother, came home with us. And while we were talking with Marguerite that evening, she was she was obviously trying to think ways she's going to make money out of this. She wanted uh, Lee to be enough involved that, that her story would be valuable. And she didn't want him to be so involved that he'd get executed. But I emphatically deny these charges. I saw Lee Harvey Oswald being led to an interrogation room. They're taking him down the hall. Unbelievable that that kind of a situation was allowed to exist. That hall is so crowded with newspaper people and onlookers who didn't belong there, uh, plus police officers and so on. If anyone had shot Oswald that night, he couldn't have fallen down. As reporters fired questions and photographers jostled for better angles, one interested bystander just looked on that Friday night, a Dallas strip joint owner named Jack Ruby. Jack was like an honorary policeman. That's why he could get into the police station. All of those detectives and policemen used to visit Jack's nightclub. He was a likable fellow. Ruby was like horse manure. Wherever there was anything going on, he was all over town. Ruby ran the Carousel Club. To find new strippers, he dealt with the Mafia. To keep his license, he courted cops. To get attention, he'd do almost anything. He wanted notoriety so badly. He just wanted people to know Jack Ruby was there. A tough guy. He was his own bouncer in his nightclub. Jack was a loser. Nice guy, pretty handy with his fists. If he was upset with you, he'd just grab you and throw you down the steps. Came from that kind of a neighborhood in Chicago. That's the way he grew up. Jack was very upset from the time Oswald shot Kennedy. He hated him for killing the president. He loved President Kennedy. And so did millions of other people. Millions. There are a lot of people that are saying they should kill Oswald. A lot of people. On Sunday morning, we were getting ready to transfer Oswald to the county jail. I kind of jokingly or in jest said to Lee, I said, Lee, if anybody shoots at you, I hope they're as good a shot as you are. Meaning, of course, that they'd hit him and not me. He kind of laughed or smiled, and it's the only time I saw him smile or during the entire time he was in custody. When I started to transfer him down to the basement, I had my left arm handcuffed to his right, and I was wearing the light-colored suit. I could see out of the corner of my eye Jack Ruby come out of the crowd with the pistol in his hand. I saw what I thought was a detective. He was dressed just like a detective with a snap brim fedora hat, and it was Jack Ruby. He saw all the cameras there. This was like a big Broadway stage. Oswald is coming toward him, and he would look at us like we were dirt. This is one thing that got to Ruby. He mentioned the fact that he didn't like his smirk. There is Lee Oswald. He's been shot. He's been shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. There's a man with a gun. It's absolute panic. Absolute panic here in the basement of Dallas Police Headquarters. Detectives have their guns drawn. Oswald has been shot. Here comes Oswald. He's, he is ashen and unconscious at this time, now being moved in. He's not moving. My statement will be very brief. Oswald expired at 1.07 p.m. We have arrested the man. The man will be charged with murder. Who is he? 
The man, the suspect's name is Jack Rubenstein, I believe. He goes by the name of Jack Ruby. I knew Jack Ruby That's from years had. back. And I asked him later, I went to see him in the jail after that. I said, Jack, why did you do that? You didn't have to kill him. I says, I could have killed him over there in the theater, but I want to know what he's all about. And he said, well, the reason I did it was because I didn't want Jackie Kennedy to have to go through a lengthy trial here in Dallas. So he's just an emotional man, as always was. I talked to Jack in jail just within an hour after he killed Oswald. And his explanation was that you guys couldn't do it. Kill the man that killed the president. Of course, Jack's problem was that uh, when he killed Oswald, he had taken the sporting element out of it. Uh, Oswald was in handcuffs, and you, it just really isn't socially acceptable to shoot somebody in the handcuffs. I'm positive that he, he saw himself appearing on the Ed Sullivan show the following Sunday. There was an outpouring of, uh, of telegrams and letters and phone calls praising what he had done by shooting Oswald before uh, much of the country came to its senses and realized that he had silenced the one human being who who could unlock the whole story about the, the president's death. I can see that today. That weird sheriff in the back with this sort of awkward look. I remember Oswald's face. You remember what you thought? Where will it all end? Where will it all end? What's, what's going on here? You began to wonder what was really happening in America. I mean, was there a vast conspiracy afoot? What was being accomplished here? That began for the first time to awaken theories that there might have, might have been some larger participation in that and that Oswald had been rubbed out uh, because to keep him quiet and that uh, this the theories of mob uh, involvement in the assassination Jack Ruby had had mob connections those underworld ties had begun in Chicago some of Ruby's childhood friends had become big shots in the mob but there is no proof that Ruby ever did business with any of them. He visited Havana the year Castro took over, but apparently only to have a good time. He often went to New Orleans. That's where he found his showgirls and where he dealt with the mafia. But there is no solid evidence of any other mob connection or conspiracy. He's been accused of being a front for the mafia and a fixer for this and that. He couldn't even fix his own traffic tickets. And as far as uh, him being around the mafia, they wouldn't have let that blabbermouth within a half a mile of one of their hotel rooms. Ruby was charged with murder. Just four months after killing Oswald, he heard the verdict. We, the jury, find the defendant guilty of murder with malice as charged in the indictment and assess his punishment at death. Signed, Max E. Causey Foreman. Ruby died in jail. Cancer, said all the doctors. Cover-up, charged conspiracy buffs. More about charges of cover-ups and conspiracies when we come back. Safety is something we all think about. Buick has considered the subject from many angles. So for frontal impacts, Buick Regal offers a driver's side airbag. And for side impacts, Regal meets 1997 government safety standards right now. Three years in advance. Why has Buick put so much into Regal? Because you put so much into Regal. Regal from Buick, the new symbol for quality in America. You wouldn't take your $1,200 evening gown to a laundromat, so why take your GM vehicle to anyone other than your GM dealer? No one else has the training and genuine GM parts to protect your investment. So when you need service, come back to your GM dealer. Canker sores are torture. New SensorGuard stops the pain fast and stops mm. it for hours. SensorGuard won't wash off. SensorGuard stops the pain fast, stops it for hours. New SensorGuard stays on guard against canker sore pain. Today for sinus sufferers, from the makers of full prescription strength, ActiFed, there's ActiFed Sinus, daytime, nighttime. The first sinus relief system with two formulas to treat sinus pain right, day and night. The daytime formula breaks up sinus congestion so you can breathe without making you drowsy. The nighttime formula is maximum strength so you can rest. Your sinus is better? Oh, yeah. ActiFed Sinus, daytime, nighttime, treat sinus pain right, day and night. 
Introducing a delicious new way to lose weight. Great tasting shakes and fabulous fruit flavors from Ultra Slim Fast. Lose weight, feel great. There's luscious orange pineapple, refreshing apple cranberry raspberry, and delicious orange banana strawberry. I lost 50 pounds in six months on the Ultra Slim Fast plan. Lose weight, feel great. Try these fabulous new fruit flavors from Ultra Slim Fast. Give us a week, we'll take out the weight. When we come back, did Oswald really do it? The shots that killed President Kennedy didn't come from the book depository. Was there a conspiracy? Both the CIA and the FBI withheld information from the Warren Commission. Tough questions, hard answers, next. A weekend to remember starting Saturday when Dr. Quinn returns home. She'll meet a man who will steal her heart. Are you going to marry him? A special two-hour Dr. Quinn. Then on Sunday, the Waltons are coming home. Ralph Waite, Michael Lernan, and Richard Thomas are reunited for a Walton Thanksgiving. Two special nights, a weekend to remember. Sicily's ancestors were cannibals, and the fever is sweeping town. I'd eat you first, Dr. Fleischman. I think you want someone a little younger. Northern Exposure, Monday. This is CBS. No, you haven't seen this before. Introducing the tough new chip resistant finish on the 94 Chevy S series. So new from the inside out. Everything else is history. I'd like a steak for dinner. <laughs> so would I. You know, maybe I'd like some seafood. Yeah. Would you make up your mind? Sizzler's introducing Build Your Own Platter for lunch or dinner. Eight great items to pick from. Choose one like grilled chicken for $3.99. Choose any two like steak and shrimp for $5.99. Choose any three and build your own huge platter for $7.99. I'll have the steak and scallops. I'll have the salmon and shrimp. <laughs> Me too. Would you make up your mind? Scared Sexless on Action News tonight at 11. CBS reports. Who killed JFK? The final chapter continues with Dan Rather. A president killed, the alleged assassin murdered insatiable curiosity and unanswered questions. It's no wonder that there's widespread belief there was a conspiracy to kill JFK. According to a special CBS reports poll last month, an astonishing number, almost nine out of 10 Americans said they believe Oswald did not act alone. Four out of five people, more than ever before, said they believe there was an official cover-up to keep the public from learning the truth about the assassination. The seven members of the Warren Commission, headed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, come to the White House to give to the President the results of their painstaking investigation into the determinable facts of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. The Commission reports that the fatal shots that entered President Kennedy's head and throat were fired by Lee Harvey Oswald from the Texas School Book Depository, acting solely by himself, and that there was no conspiracy, either foreign or domestic. The Warren Commission was a band-aid on open-heart surgery. The attempt was to quiet down the country, to, to let them know the country was going to move ahead. Um, it was not to get justice for John Kennedy. And it's been put to me a number of times by people who studied the Kennedy assassination, say, well, listen, you had a case of Katzenbach decided early on it was Oswald. He helped get the Warren Commission started, and a, and a momentum started, perhaps with the best of intentions, to conclude quickly and convince the public quickly that Oswald was the one and the only one. If Oswald was the only one, it was going to require a thorough investigation by people who were impeccable to get all of the facts out, not to suppress anything, if that was to be believed. What was your biggest yeah. mistake? I certainly wrote a memo to the president, to Bill Moyers, I guess, uh, which is not as artfully worded as I would like it to be. The first part of Katzenbach's memo urges a thorough investigation. It's the second part that strikes some as conspiratorial. It said, and I quote now from it, 
the public must be satisfied that Oswald was the assassin, that he did not have Confederates who were still at large, and that the evidence was such that he would have been convicted at trial. Continuing to quote, speculation about Oswald's motivation ought to be cut off, end of quotation. What I meant was that they, if you don't put all of the facts out and they don't have all of the facts, and there are some facts that are concealed, you are never going to get them to get rid of, to believe that Oswald did this all alone, even if that is your conclusion. So I think if you showed that document to a thousand people, 999 would view it as a, some kind of a cover-up. Instead of hiring enough investigators of its own, the Warren Commission mainly relied upon the FBI and CIA. Those agencies withheld information, leading to speculation that the FBI and CIA were part of a plot to kill Kennedy and covered it up. Hoover's FBI had at least one major thing they had to cover up, and that would have been their uh, inadequacy in protecting the president. The Secret Service has the job of protecting presidents. It relies on the FBI for information. The FBI agent in charge of tracking the Oswalds in Dallas was James Hostie. I don't think we had any information at all, or at least I had no information at all, that Oswald was dangerous. But he did have new information that Oswald might be an imminent threat. The CIA had been bugging the Soviet embassy in Mexico and told the FBI of Oswald's mysterious visit. But Agent Hostie still saw no reason to inform the Secret Service. The CIA lead did prompt Agent Hostie to look for Lee Oswald to see what he was up to. But Hostie only found Marina. Oswald later came to the Dallas FBI building and left Hostie a note. Hostie's secretary says that note was a warning. Stop bothering Marina or else the Dallas Police Department or FBI office would be blown up. Hostie says the note contained no violent threats. That was in early November. I just tossed a letter into my file drawer for, for further uh, investigation at a later time and forgot about it until the uh, day of the assassination. And on that day, the FBI still had not warned the Secret Service that Oswald might be a security risk and could have a clear shot at the president. After Oswald was killed, I was told to uh, get rid of the letter that, I, that the agent in charge said he didn't ever want to see the letter again. So I then carried out his instructions. Agent Hostie flushed the letter down a toilet in the FBI building the evening Oswald was killed. J. Edgar Hoover never told any of this to the Warren Commission. But how relevant is that to a possible murder conspiracy? It's evident that the FBI withheld information from the Warren Commission, information that would have been vital for an adequate investigation. I do not think, personally, that they withheld it as part of some sinister cover-up. I think they withheld it for self-protective bureaucratic reasons, because it would have exposed uh, their own incompetence and failure. Just about every FBI agent says any and all leads were pursued. But many Americans still point to what they consider to be four main suspects as possible conspirators. The Soviets, extremists in the CIA, the Mafia, and Cubans, pro or anti Fidel Castro. Each may seem to have had a motive to be part of a conspiracy to assassinate the president. For 30 years, there has been much speculation Tonight, let's look at some facts. First, the Soviets. One of the first things that the U.S. government did after John Kennedy was assassinated was what an intelligence service always does, which is to locate the leader of the enemy power, in this case Khrushchev. They couldn't find where he was, and they couldn't find him for a period of time. That led many people in the American government to think that maybe this was a case in which the Russians were involved, that they might have killed Kennedy, they might have had the intention of doing this to confuse the United States, throw it into chaos, at which time they could launch a surprise attack against the United States. This is something that the American people did not know that afternoon. Had they known it, they would have been even more anxious and upset than they already were. The Cold War was near its height that November. Only one year earlier, the Americans and Russians nearly went to war when Russia secretly sent nuclear missiles to Havana. Khrushchev removed the missiles, but tension and a Soviet motive to get rid of Kennedy were very much in existence on November 22, 1963. The first reaction, it was shock, simply shock. How come it was killed? 
but especially that was killed by the American who defected the Soviet Union then returned back. This was the shock that they will not be put fingers on the KGB, on the Soviet Union. And as far as what I have seen, there wasn't a single indication that it was done by the Soviets. Khrushchev, when he found the news that a suspected assassin of Kennedy, Lee Harvey Oswald, was a defector to the Soviet Union and back again, Khrushchev was terrified that the United States would then immediately presume that Kennedy had been killed by the Russians and therefore the United States might retaliate very soon with a surprise attack against the Soviet Union. He rushed to the American embassy without warning and what he said was, you must believe me, the Soviet Union had nothing to do with the murder of John Kennedy. As a former officer of KGB, if they became mad, decided to kill American presidents, they would try not to leave any spots, races to them. Since the end of the Cold War, thousands of KGB documents have come to light. None has revealed any Soviet plot. So, how about the Central Intelligence Agency? Belief that the CIA killed Kennedy was a theme of the popular, but not always factual, movie JFK. Y'all gotta start thinking on a different level, like the CIA does. The CIA was a conspiracy contender long before the motion picture. Well, the motive. I suppose we can think of three different things. Number one, John Kennedy was ending the war in Vietnam. Number two, John Kennedy was involved in a program of rapprochement with Fidel Castro. But above all, John Kennedy said, I'm going to destroy the Central Intelligence Agency. Absolute nonsense. This is not a shred of truth in that. I don't know a single person in the whole Central Intelligence Agency, and at that point I'd been, I'd been there about 25 years, who would have felt anything like that. There's no possibility that mavericks within the agency did things that you were not aware of. There was an unwritten, but nevertheless written in blood, law in the agency. And that was that since we were involved in clandestine work overseas, lying, sometimes bribing, corrupting, whatever the case might be, that the one thing that a member of the CIA could not do was lie inside the agency to his superiors. And I've learned one thing in my 30 years in Washington, Dan, and that is, if more than two people know anything, it will leak. Sometimes fiction is more believable than fact, but to date, the only evidence of a CIA connection is conjectural, circumstantial, and cinematic. If not the CIA, what was the Mafia's motive to see Kennedy kill? The mob had been something which never much concerned the FBI until Robert Kennedy became Attorney General, and the mob obviously did not like this. Robert Kennedy first won the disrespect of the mafia as chief counsel to a Senate rackets committee. If uh, you have opposition from anybody that you dispose of them by having them stuffed in a trunk, is that what you do, Mr. Gene Connor? The kind to answer because I honestly believe my answer might tend to incriminate me. I thought only little girls giggled, Mr. Gene Connor. <laughs> As Attorney General, one of Robert Kennedy's prime targets was Carlos Marcello, head of the mob in New Orleans. The best way to stop Robert, say the Mafia school of conspirators, was to kill John. Mobster Marcello supposedly equated them to a dog. You cut off the head of the dog and then the tail dies. And I had instant recognition on that sentence. I think it meant you killed the president and uh, Bobby's taken care of. Marcello denied saying this, and because of an FBI nationwide operation, agents should have known what any mafioso was up to. We had put microphones into the headquarters of the Chicago mob, and specifically into the headquarters of the boss of the Chicago mob, Sam Giancana. And at that time, they spoke constantly of everything that they were doing, who they were going to murder, the public politicians, who they were corrupting, and so they were hiding nothing. Then when the assassination took place, they were very, very happy, very gleeful uh, that he had been killed. They made no bones that they were happy that it happened, but at no time did they indicate that they had anything to do with it. But conspiracy theorists point to Oswald's alleged ties to marginal mafia figures while he was living in New Orleans. An address on some of his handouts was of a building where Guy Bannister, a right-wing radical and ex-FBI agent, had his detective office. He often was visited by David Ferry, 
a fervent anti-communist. Both did some investigation work for Carlos Marcelo's lawyers, but there's neither evidence of any collusion between the three, nor solid proof that Oswald even met them. I can't believe that the Mafia would have given this to somebody like Oswald, would have said, you're our man, you go up there and make some remarkable shots. And uh, I think that if Oswald, had, if, if the Mafia had done this, Oswald wouldn't have been alive to be arrested. If not the Mafia, what about Cubans and Castro? On the day Kennedy was killed, on November 22nd, 1963, a case officer from CIA was offering to an agent of CIA a ballpoint pen to be used to kill Castro, a pen which had been converted by a medical doctor into a hypodermic, which would be used to maybe put some poison into Castro if he could get close enough to him. Did it occur to you to volunteer this to the Warren Commission? You said you weren't asked. No. You know, you can't run secret intelligence operations to go around telling the world about them, including anything as open as the Warren Commission and expect to have any operations left. And uh, since we didn't see how there could be any connection between these two things, obviously, we didn't say anything. But it was never a secret to Castro that President Kennedy wanted to kill him. Two years before the assassination, JFK authorized the Bay of Pigs invasion. It was a disaster. Within three days, the army of CIA-trained Cuban exiles gave up. President Kennedy kept going. We try to kill Castro. I made three attempts to try to kill Castro, okay? Kennedy made his attempts with other people and double agents to try to kill Castro. You think for a minute they're going to sit on their ass and not do anything to retaliate? The CIA had even approached some mafia figures to kill Castro. But none of JFK's secret war against Castro was told to the Warren Commission. And so the allegation persists that the Warren Commission did not try hard enough to find any Cuban conspiracy connection. Was a colossal insanity. Fidel Castro, interviewed by CBS reports in 1977, denied any involvement. Cuba, Castro said, risked being blown off the map by U.S. bombs if he were behind any conspiracy. Anyone who thought otherwise was insane. The staff report said there was no conspiracy, period. Former President Gerald Ford is the only living member of the Warren Commission. He remembers there was discord between the commissioners and their staff, prompting critics to say that's evidence of a cover-up. Well, we on the commission said we're not in a position to make that firm a conclusion. So we wrote in our report, the commission found no evidence of a conspiracy, foreign or domestic. Now that's very important. I should add, however, I have seen no evidence since then, and this is 30 years, that would indicate to me there was a conspiracy. And no one else in three decades has found any conspiracy. Motives? Plenty. Credible evidence? None. Knowledgeable skeptics remain unconvinced. The Warren Commission went along with making things calm again not going out to see who killed Kennedy, who could have got Oswald to do it. And, you know, 30 years later, it's tough to go back and retrace those steps. And who do Americans believe are the conspirators? Almost half the people polled by CBS reports think it was the CIA. More than one out of three blame the mafia. Over one in five points to Cubans. 13% say it was the Soviets. And one more revealing finding. The younger you are, the more likely you are to believe that there was a conspiracy. Like the Lexus LS400, the Nissan Altima has specially tuned shock absorbers and front and rear subframes that give it an exceptionally smooth ride. But the Altima costs less than half the money, which means you'll also have the added cushioning of a very thick wallet. Lease a specially equipped Altima GXE for just $750 down and $229 a month for 36 months.
Drop everything. This is too big to miss. Color Tile's 40th anniversary price rollback. 40, 50, 60% price cuts. Saxony carpet. Price cut, $4.99 a square yard. Price cuts on ceramic floor and wall tile. Vinyl tile, price cuts. 59 styles, all 99 cents or less. First time ever, vertical blinds buy one, get two free. First time ever, price cuts on all wood floors. Color Tile's 40th anniversary price rollback. 40, 50, 60% price cuts. You can save hundreds of dollars. Act now. Will we claim the new Norelco razor shaves closer than ever? Will have hundreds of tests to back it up? Say our new precision groove helps the Norelco lift and cut system shave closer without proof? No. We wouldn't say it's our closest shave ever without science, sensors, tests. But of all the tests that prove it's closer, the most convincing requires a personal touch. The new Norelco razors, our closest shave ever. Now the movie America fell in love with can be yours during McDonald's Holiday Film Festival. Take home the smash romantic hit Ghost for just $5.99 when you buy any large sandwich. Or treat your family to the children's classic Charlotte's Web. Isn't it great? Just $5.99 when you buy any large sandwich. You can see these new movies at theaters and own the originals. But hurry to McDonald's. What you want is what you get at McDonald's today. Monday, Herman's got big news. I can't afraid of Evening shade, then. It's Thanksgiving. And Dave gets an early holiday gift from Florence Henderson. You got us burial plots? Santa got our letter. Can America's favorite mom be Dave's favorite mother-in-law? Jeez, is that you or the broccoli? All new Dave's World after Evening Shade, Monday. Tuesday, she never dreamed their mission of mercy would become a race to survive. Lindsay Wagner stars Nurses on the Line, Crash of Flight 7, Tuesday. Searching for secret conspiracies is torturous, complex, frustrating. Accurately determining what happened in the broad daylight in Dealey Plaza before hundreds of witnesses should be an easy chore. But in this murder mystery, no answers are easy, no findings free of debate. This CBS Reports animation is exactly the way it was according to the Warren Commission. The Kennedy limousine was traveling at 11 miles an hour, about to make a left turn onto Elm, on the sixth floor of the Book Depository building, alone, hidden from any co-worker who might pass by, lurked Lee Harvey Oswald. What happened next? That question has puzzled people for 30 years. I don't believe that Oswald was the only one. Many make a pilgrimage to Dealey Plaza from around the world. Looking for answers. I want to know what happened. Some looking for money. Yeah, these are three bucks. The assassination isn't just an obsession. And if this is all hogwash, let it be hogwash then. If I'm wrong, let me be one. It's a national industry. You want me to ring it up? Trinkets for tourists. There you go. There's, that's you. Almost 500 books and still counting. It was the crime of the century. This was the president of the United States, and we don't know. We don't know the answer, and I feel like as an American citizen, I have a right to know who killed my president. Most Americans don't think they know who was the real murderer. According to our poll, almost nine out of ten Americans now think there were at least two gunmen. This distrust of the Warren Commission's single gunman theory is often tied to the testimony of three self-proclaimed eyewitnesses, all claim seeing a second gunman shooting from behind the picket fence. There is Beverly Oliver. The shots that killed President Kennedy didn't come from the book depository. Deaf-mute Ed Hoffman. They were talking about the fact that Mr. Oswald was up in that school book, and I kept saying, no, he was not there. I saw this. I was standing here. I saw this. I saw the whole thing. And Gene Hill. They know me as the lady in red because it was the only thing in red that the cameras picked up that day. How credible are their stories? First, Miss Hill, who is standing across the street from the grassy knoll and picket fence. So, I was standing right here when Kennedy's car came down and the shots started ringing out and I looked up across the street behind the picket fence up there by the tree there in, right there in the bushes, this man, 
was shooting with a rifle and I saw a puff of smoke and a flash of light at the very instant that Kennedy's head exploded. Over the years, Jean's changed her story a number of times. She's a very sweet lady. Ferris Rookstool is an FBI employee by day, an assassination researcher by night. He maintains each witness's story falls apart upon close examination. But she's changed her story from saying that she said that she saw some activity in and around the picket fence now. Back in 63, she was unable to, to put a shooter or a gunman behind the grassy knoll. Did you see the person who, who uh, fired the... No, not, I didn't see any person fire the weapon. You only heard it? I only heard it. Just as the president became, came right even with us, we looked at him and he was looking at a dog in the middle of the seat. There was no dog. It's now suggested Miss Hill may have mistaken flowers in the limousine for an animal. This has caused her the source of a lot of embarrassment. Yet at the same time, Jean Hill has stated some half a block away to a block away, she stated that in fact she saw a man running at a high rate of speed, which she is able to identify as a man resembling Jack Ruby. How about Ed Hoffman and his story? Over here on Stemmons Freeway was where Edward Hoffman parked his car, got out of it to watch the presidential motorcade. And as he looked back over here towards the school book depository, of course, the trees weren't as full in 1963. This is where he said he saw some activity happening around the picket fence area. As you can clearly see, it's some 200 yards between the freeway and over there near the uh, concrete colonnades and picket fence area. Mr. Hoffman, with the help of an interpreter, recalls what he saw. And I happened to see uh, someone fire a rifle and it, and I was absolutely stunned. And then I saw the person run back this way. Ed Hoffman went to the FBI in 1967, some four years after the assassination, and first reported seeing some sort of activity near the picket fence. Two hours later, he went back to the FBI and claimed that he was not able to see any activity near the uh, picket fence, as his view was obstructed by the fence. It was very clear to me what I saw. And you know, I can't lie to what I saw. You know, this is really important. We were talking about the death of a president of the United States. Mr. Hoffman's own father in 1967 said that he found his son's story to be incredible. He said his son had made up things in the past and he found, uh, found his son not to be a very credible witness. To the right of Gene Hill, we see a, uh, a figure that's been identified as the Babushka lady, simply because this lady was wearing a scarf wrapped around her head. Today, we have a person who claims to be the Babushka lady a lady by the name of Beverly Oliver. I was standing just behind Jean Hill with a movie camera. The shots that killed President Kennedy didn't come from the book depository. came from behind that picket fence. 30 Oliver says her film might show a gunman behind the picket fence. The problem is that no one has appeared who has seen the film. I didn't go back to work until Monday night, at which time there was two men waiting on the landing of the stairwell at the Colony Club. One of them identified himself as an FBI agent by the name of Regis Kennedy, and he took my film and has never been seen since. Beverly is the only person that can place herself here in Dealey Plaza at the time of the assassination. And she did not surface until some 1969, 1970, some five years, six years after the assassination. There are substantial problems with her story, uh, among them. Gerald Posner has investigated evidence like new and picture. old for his book, she tells Case story, Closed. She says that she was taking her pictures that day with a Yashica Super 8 Zoom movie camera. Turns out that after she first told her story, somebody looked that up, and that camera didn't exist in 1963. Wasn't manufactured until 1968. She says she was 17 or 19 years old. The Babushka lady appears middle-aged. The Babushka lady is heavy. There are pictures of Beverly Oliver at the time. She was a dancer, a singer at one of the clubs that competed with Jack Ruby in Dallas, one of the strip clubs. She was quite trim. Regis Kennedy, the FBI man, she says that confiscated her film, was an agent based out of New Orleans. He wasn't even in Dallas on the day that she claims he took the film. She picked somebody from the wrong city. Look at the world. Seven continents, 24 time zones, and at last count, 187 countries. Thanks to the power of Sprint's international connections, you can be there now in virtually any one of them. This is your life. This is your world. Sprint Express, may I help you? This is your chance. Wait, hello? Sprint is the only global phone company that offers everything, local, long distance, and cellular. 
whether calling around the world or around the corner, Sprint's the choice of millions who want to be there now. Hello. How did you find me? So whoever said the world doesn't revolve around you obviously didn't have a Sprint. do after you introduce the first compact flare side on the planet you make an even bigger splash announcing the ford ranger splash super cab now the cool original also comes in a more spacious rendition the 1994 ford ranger splash and splash super cab now how big a splash you make is up to you Hey, sport, what are you doing? Waiting for you. I can't use the toaster myself. Will you make me an Eggo waffle? Absolutely. It's part of a dad's job to make his kids a crisp, delicious Eggo. In fact, my dad used to make these for me, all golden and toasty. He did? Yep. Hey, look at my Eggo. <laughs> Sorry, it looks so good. Dad, will I ever be old enough to make my own Eggo? Someday. Right now, I kind of like this arrangement. CBS reports, Who Killed JFK? The final chapter will continue. Tonight, Dana Carvey. I did not know that. Ah! Meatloaf and Joan Cusack. <laughs> Folks, if you don't have a show of your own, watch mine. What's the toughest part of parenthood? When your child asks about death. I haven't even figured out how I'm going to explain the Reagan years. Murphy Brown. Then, everyone loves a Thanksgiving parade. What are you doing watching this parade on a three-inch screen when it's right here in front of you? Casey Case and Madonna Mills really bring it to life for me. Love and War after Murphy Brown Monday. This is CBS. If you're thinking about buying a Toyota truck, there's one important option you should know about. The Ford Ranger. And what an option. You can lease a 94 Ranger XLT for just $192 a month for two years. After rebate, all you need is just $392 in cash. And look what $392 gets you. Rear anti-lock brakes, power steering, sliding rear window, AM FM stereo cassette, alloy wheels. Hey, only one compact truck is built for tough. The Ranger. Last year, I put up so many lights, I thought airplanes would mistake the roof for a landing strip. This year, I draw the line. Add new charm to your tree with carousel ornaments by Mr. Christmas. In sets of three, just $24.99. Enjoy the music while six carousel horses play 21 favorite carols. For tree or mantle, just $54.99 at Target. Last year, I thought we had a few bare spots. But 2,000 more of these should do the trick. Right, honey? It's a wonderful life. On Nightcast, angry parents, frightened children. They're demanding answers about a child molester attacking in their neighborhood. An emotional outburst in court from a man accused of a horrible crime will show you what happened. And women who want to have sex but can't will tell you why they're scared sexless at 11. This is a man liquor Kakano an Italian-made 6.5-millimeter military rifle, the same model as the one Lee Harvey Oswald owned and allegedly used to kill President Kennedy. It's a relatively simple weapon, but many researchers are convinced that neither it nor Oswald could fire as fast and accurately as stated by the Warren Commission. The Warren Commission began its case against Oswald with accounts of his co-workers, photographed here seconds after the shooting looking out from the floor directly beneath Oswald. I could even not hear the empty cartridges hitting the floor, I mean, after the shots had been fired. It was a bang, then a bang, bang, like that, you know. About like that, you know, boom, then triplet, boom, then triplet, boom. Here's the Warren Commission shooting scenario of those three shots. Oswald did not first pull the trigger until the limousine went past the tree. Two shots hit, one missed. Using the now famous Sapruder film, the commission calculated there were about five and a half seconds between the first shot and the third fatal shot. Using just a stationary test target, the commission concluded Oswald could have done it. 
CBS News did its own independent test in 1967. We built a target and test track to match exactly the dimensions of Dealey Plaza and asked 11 volunteer marksmen to see how quickly they could fire a Mannlicher Carcano. They shot at a target moving at the estimated speed of the motorcade. One shooter, a weapons manufacturer, made three hits within five and a half seconds. Only three others managed two hits in that short time. All 11 had several chances, so it can be done. But the odds are against it. Supporting the theory that there perhaps was more than one gunman. But what if the Warren Commission's scenario of five and a half seconds is wrong? What if Oswald had more time, much more time? What if he took his first shot before the car passed the tree and missed, giving more time for the second shot and making the third and fatal shot the easiest of all? Oswald, in fact, had eight and a half seconds for all three shots. To be able to readjust your sight and your aim is what makes the difference in this shooting. Author Gerald Posner's findings are provocative, but are they provable? We can look at the Zapruder film, and with new enhancements and new technology, that film can answer exactly what took place on November 22nd. The first shot, said the Warren Commission, might have struck the president. Posner disagrees saying it was deflected by the tree. There's some evidence on the film itself of this early missed shot. The president is just bringing his hand down from a wave, and I believe this is part of what you'll see as his reaction to this first shot. And there's key testimony from a young girl, Rosemary Willis, with a white jacket on and a red skirt, who's running along with the automobile. As the president is bringing his hand down from a wave, she starts to slow up, and then she stops completely here. She is turning around, as she correctly remembers, because she heard a shot from this direction. That film discovery of a possible early missed shot and a longer time to fire three shots is new. The theory is old. 26 years ago, CBS reported on the findings of physicist Luis Alvarez. Alvarez noticed that Abe Sapruder slightly jiggled his 8mm camera three times, causing the film to blur. Could he have been startled by three rifle shots? We tried it ourselves using other cameramen standing on a rifle range holding similar cameras filming an automobile while shots were fired over their heads. Their instructions, hold the cameras as steady as possible and keep filming no matter what happens. The reaction was obvious. They jiggled with each shot. The blurs in the films they took occur at the same times as in the Sapruder film. And the first blur happens precisely when Posner says Oswald got off the first shot, supporting the theory that Oswald had more time to get off three shots, not the far more difficult five and a half seconds estimated by the Warren Commission. Making it easier yet again, says Posner, is that Oswald had more time to aim his rifle for the shot that first hit Kennedy. The Warren Commission thought that bullet struck Kennedy when the car was behind the sign. Posner says it was later, after the car passed the sign. The president is emerging here. You can see the president coming down from a wave. In the next frame, the president's elbow jerks off of the car. What has happened to the president is the bullet that has struck him in this portion of his back has passed through it, has chipped some bone along his spinal cord, and induced a neurological spinal reaction called the Thorburn's position. You can see the president's hands coming up, not to his throat, but locking in front of his chin, and they will be locked in that position. Until he's shot in the head and the cortex is destroyed, he cannot lower his arms. They are physically locked. Now for the greatest controversy about this single bullet, what critics call the magic bullet. These three shell casings were found on the sixth floor of the book depository. Only two bullets were recovered. This fragmented bullet, said the Warren Commission, was the third shot, the one that hit the president in the head. Therefore, the Warren Commission concluded, this other, what critics call magic bullet, must have gone through President Kennedy and then into Governor Connolly's back, out his chest, through his right wrist, and finally into his left thigh. The single bullet theory, which is the Warren Commission report sine qua non, if you don't have a single bullet theory, you've got two people shooting. Said, what happened to the bullet that went through President Kennedy's neck? 
David Bellin was a lawyer for the Warren Commission. He came up with the single bullet theory. We reconstructed the motorcade, went frame by frame using the Zapruder film. It turned out that they were right on line at the time that shot first struck. To test the single bullet theory, PBS two years ago used computer animation techniques not available to the Warren Commission. Precise measurements of Dealey Plaza and the speed and location of the Kennedy limousine were taken to analyze if one shot from the sixth floor of the book depository could duplicate the angle and damage of the magic bullet shot. If the governor did turn, as he recalls, perhaps reacting to an earlier shot that missed, the trajectories line up and lead back to the sixth floor window. This is frame 223 on the Zapruder film. The president, you're just starting to see his shirt cuff here coming out from behind the sign. Here you can see on both sides of Governor Connolly his white shirt. And there's his tie right in the middle. In the next frame, something very interesting happens. This lapel on his jacket. His right lapel. Right lapel blows up covering this part of his shirt. It now eliminates this great question mark of when was the governor and the president struck by a second shot. And how about the third and fatal shot? For nearly 30 years, critics of the Warren Commission insist it came from the front, proving, they say, there was a second gunman. We have the body going forward. We have a car moving in that direction. We have the bullet coming in this direction, according to the Warren Commission, and yet we have the body moving back this way. That's a popular theory, but the film reveals Kennedy's head first goes slightly forward. There is a small movement of the present. It's calculated as about two and a half to three inches forward. Then this exit takes place. All the evidence clearly shows there were two and only two gunshot wounds from behind. And there's no question that that bullet wound in the back of the head is a typical, classic um, entrance wound. Those in the military and those who hunt know that the entry wound tends to be the small wound. So if you hit, hit a deer or a person, you're most likely to have a small movement forward when the bullet enters. And then as the bullet exits, it blows back. That's right. It happens so fast. We can see, and it's terrible because, not to be gruesome, but this pinkish cloud coming out of the president, but to the front. Now this is key that the president has been hit from the rear. If he's hit from the front, we would expect to see on this film the red cloud should be behind the president as the bullet exits. In addition, you can see right here a line of material. This is also shooting out of the president's head. This is partially skull and brain matter that is going up and to the front. We now have the photographic evidence of a shot from the rear. And a last and fascinating question. Was the limousine really going at 11 miles per hour when Kennedy was killed? Bill Greer, who was the oldest member of the Secret Service Detachment. He was the wheel man. He was the wheel man. He remembered looking around toward this commotion in the back of the car after the president was first hit, which would have been this shot near the sign. Seeing the president react, he said he then turned around before the fatal headshot, hit the accelerator, and they were zooming out of Dealey at the time the bullet hit the president in the head. What we will see is before the president's fatal headshot, Mr. Greer over on the left-hand side of the car in front of the windshield, very difficult to see, but his head here will turn around. Indeed it does. And you will see him actually looking at the president at the moment of the fatal headshot. He then, if we follow him after this shot, turns around in panic, ducks down. You can see him hunched over and hits the accelerator. So what it means is he has inadvertently given Oswald the easiest of the three shots. When we come back, day four, when everything stopped, everyone watched, and nobody forgot. It's Domino's $25 million Super Mario All-Star Instant Win Game. With every order, get a free chance to win thousands of special power set prizes. Now buy our new crunchy thin crust pizza and get free twisty bread. Something for nothing when you call Domino's. Vibrant shampoos and conditioners with vitamins and keratin strengthen hair inside. So it shines on the outside. Give your hair the strength to shine. Vibrance. You're giving me cold cereal? Yeah, but not just any cold cereal. This is different. Quaker toasted oatmeal? Yep. 
Hey, this tastes good. Well, it should. With all these oatmeal flakes, touch of brown sugar, sounds good too. But there's more. Whole grains of oatmeal on every oatmeal flake. Heck, that's oatmeal on top of oatmeal. Same good stuff as the hot. Quaker Toasted Oatmeal, original and honey nut. It's my other oatmeal. The fashion shows are exciting, but I'm here to work. I'm one of the buyers for Sears. Our team looks at clothes through the customer's eyes to find exactly what she wants in dresses, sportswear, everything. Bringing a new sense of style to Sears. Now that's a job for a woman. Come see the softer side of Sears. She burst from anonymity to take home a silver medal at the 93 World Championships and quickly became one of the brightest stars on the U.S. ski team. About 65 miles south of the nearest stoplight, and two miles up in the Rocky Mountain sky, you'll find skiers heaven, also known as Telluride Ski Mountain, where the skiing's perfect and the views are even better. And whether you're going to extremes or just going for a lesson, don't go without your visa card, because at Telluride Ski Mountain, they'll let you take the plunge, but they won't take American Express. Visa, it's everywhere you want to be. Peekaboo Street was just called Little Girl until age two when her hippie parents named her for an Indian tribe. Now the girl who grew up in Triumph, Idaho, is hoping to triumph in Lillehammer. The Olympic Winter Games returning to CBS. This Olympic moment sponsored by Visa. It's everywhere you want to be. When a battered wife finds sympathy in another man. You deserve a good life. And a bored husband catches the eye of an alluring stranger. She makes me feel sexual. Exactly who is seducing whom? Your wife told me you were working late. Are you having an affair, Jimmy? It's an all-new episode when Picket Fences returns next Friday. Rejected by one man, tempted by another, and now trapped by a mysterious murder. For Kate Benedict, it's time to believe in Second Chances. Premieres December 2nd. I remember the morning of the last day, that Monday morning, like 15, 16 blocks almost, of people just waiting in line, moving quietly. Uh, police said crime went down um, during that period. But it was something that kind of eerie feeling, uh, like, uh, what do we do next? Washington, D.C. was stunned. Washington, D.C. was silent, unable to function. The town closed up like a black flower. There were no enemies. People who had criticized President Kennedy felt guilty, and everybody was just united. The president's assassination was a wound for the nation, as graphic and meaningful and painful as it was for so many individuals. And Mrs. Kennedy, who really instructed the details of those days much more directly than anyone, understood that, and the nation should be forever in her debt. She knew it was John's birthday, the day of the funeral, and we all went back upstairs. We called the living quarters the mansion, and, and Jackie and Bobby and Teddy and myself and Lee and my wife, Jo, were singing happy birthday. Uh, you know, all of us with tears in our eyes. It was the saddest damn thing, but as Jackie said, he, John knows it's his birthday. On the day of John Fitzgerald Kennedy's funeral, a smaller service was held in Fort Worth, Texas. There were few mourners, and newsmen anxious to finish their assignment helped carry the casket so Lee Oswald was buried, and with him, the answers to questions about his crime that would haunt the nation. Why do so many Americans still doubt? The enormity of the crime, its unexpectedness, and the fact that nobody got a chance to see Oswald on a stand, people still had these doubts, and I think the doubts will remain 
a hundred years from today. I never accepted the conspiracy theory. I've never given two seconds to it. I don't even want to tolerate it as an idea. There are a lot of people around trying to make money off of new ideas for books and movies. Bully for them, but let him rest in peace. Neither before nor since do I remember being so mesmerized by anything as I was by the funeral procession, Mrs. Kennedy. The finality of it overwhelmed me at the moment. Up to then, there was a nightmare quality as the developments piled one on the other. This said, it's all true. It had happened, it was over, it was done. And we were about to bury it, bury something of our past along with that man. The drum beat, the long march to Arlington. John, John, salute him. Ackerman shouldn't cry. <laughs> to be a part of a casket team, after 1,200 funerals, it conditions you for it. But this was John F. Kennedy, uh, my hero, uh, the senator from Massachusetts, who I'd admired since age 16. We folded the flag, presented it to the cemetery director, who then presented it to Miss Kennedy, and I just sort of went to pieces. Robert Kennedy he was in a state of shock, I think, for literally months. We would, on many nights working late, go to Arlington and climb the wall and walk quietly to the president's grave. And the sentries there all knew him and saluted when he arrived. And just very quietly, he would kneel and say a prayer. And then just as quietly, we would leave. This bright and promising young man, just blown away. How can you make sense of this? How can you understand it? When you talk about it now, do you still feel the pain? Sure. I feel it for the country. You know, that was a promising time. People walked with their head held a little higher. There's a sad irony in dying young. You are frozen, and then that frozen image expands as people look back on you. It's happened to a certain extent with every figure who is struck down in the prime of life, with Martin Luther King, with John F. Kennedy, with Robert Kennedy, with Malcolm X. Uh, who's to say what these men might have become? And we invest in them all our hopes and dreams for what we wanted them to be. And I think that's happened with, with John F. Kennedy. Being in the White House with President Kennedy was like dying and going to heaven to me. I, I called him Jack the 14 years, and then it was Mr. President for two years and 10 months and two days. You no, know, and I lost the best friend I ever had. And today and tomorrow, we shall miss him. And we will never know for sure how different the world might have been had fate enabled him to complete his second term. Next on Nightcast, they want answers and they want action. Parents confront police about a child molester stalking their neighborhood. A late night Senate gun battle. Will the Brady Bill become law? Why do police want to talk with Michael Jackson's dermatologist? We have exclusive details. And a new CD that's the cat's meow. Next. Like the Lexus LS400, the Nissan Altima has specially tuned shock absorbers and front and rear subframes that give it an exceptionally smooth ride. But the Altima costs less than half the money, which means you'll also have the added cushioning of a very thick wallet. Lease a specially equipped Altima GXE for just $7.50 down and $2.29 a month for 36 months. Just a minute. It's Thanksgiving again. Why not try something the whole family can feast on? 
MCI friends and family members can save up to 50% on daytime calls on Thanksgiving and lots of other holidays throughout the year. Introducing Nestle European Style Hot Chocolates. Savor the richness of Swiss chocolate truffle. And make the world go away. Nestle European Style Hot Chocolates. You know, I'm used to ruining my own clothes. I didn't know it was a special blouse. It was from my mom. I went to the shower. Someone bumped me. The meatballs, it went all over me. Her meatballs swim in grease. Came home, washed the blouse. The stain is not out. I poured a little bit of the Tide on there. I didn't think we were going to get it out. Introducing new Tide with grease releasers. Grease this tough is so tough, many detergents could leave it behind. But nothing beats Tide. There's no stain. There isn't it. It's gone. It's gone. It looks new. If it's got to be clean, it's got to be Tide. It looks better on me. You've never been so close to a downy scent this bold. New Mountain Spring Downy, bursting with the scent of mountain air. The boldest, most refreshing downy ever. Step into the mountains, a new scent can take you there. Oh, this so refreshing, Mountain Spring is in the air. Smell New Mountain Spring Downy, bursting with a bolder new scent. As bold as mountain tops, refreshing as mountain air. Step into the mountains, New Mountain Spring Downy. Come on into Downy. Today, had he lived, John Kennedy would be 76 years old. Ironically, the shattering event that cut short his life may have increased his stature. In martyrdom, he may be remembered longer and praised more than if he had served out his presidency. There isn't a reporter in the world, including this one, who wouldn't love to uncover something, anything, that would decisively reverse or positively confirm the current weight of the evidence in this case. But despite years of trying, we at CBS News have not done that. Neither has anyone else. Accuracy and fairness dictate that we say so, whatever popular opinion may be. As a nation and as individuals, it is worth reminding ourselves that many facts are known. Many questions have been answered beyond a reasonable doubt. The Warren Commission did make mistakes, but it also got a lot right. Despite all of the attacks, the Commission's main conclusions have so far passed the test of time. There is no proof and very little of any credible evidence of any conspiracy. And the facts, including much hard physical evidence, do indicate one man was the assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald. Any contrary conclusions are speculation, based less on fact than imagination. Often by people who divine things, the ear cannot hear and the eyes cannot see. For CBS Reports, I'm Dan Rather. Good night. You won't want to miss tonight's Late Show with David Letterman with Dave's guests, Dana Carvey, Meatloaf, and a whole lot more. Stick around for the fun. Thanks for making CBS America's Most Watched Network. This is Mark McEwen, and I'll see you Monday on CBS This Morning. Now, get ready for your local news. For a transcript of tonight's CBS reports, Who Killed JFK? The Final Chapter, send $10 to Burrell's Transcripts, Box 7, Livingston, New Jersey, 07039, or call 1-800-777-TEXT. To order a video cassette, call toll-free 1-800-453-5000. Experience.